All right, well, we'll, we'll kick off then. Um, my name's Harry Rogers, I'm from um, Keridigian Stop the War Coalition, and um, we're a relatively new organisation. We're trying to build support for the organisation in Keridigian, and this event um, came about as a um, response to um, our, our activities against NATO. We were, we were talking about that. Stop the War, Kerry Diggin, is growing and we genuinely feel that there is a strong need to challenge national political parties on their foreign policy and to try to persuade them to adopt a different set of policies to the ones they are currently following. Um, in Wales, um, our, our aim is to try and stop the move towards militarisation. We see the, the government in Wales over the years, regardless of which political party have actually been in power in the, the Assembly, um, moving towards militarisation as a, as a means of solving economic development problems in Wales. And we think that, the, the, that that should be curtailed and that they should be looking for non-military means of um, developing the economy. And in Caradigian, of course, um, one, of the, one of the big issues that we face here is what's going on in Aberporth and the whole um, development of drone technology and strategies um, for unmanned aerial vehicles that they're developing down there. Um, we hope to be able to campaign strongly against that over the coming months and years. Um, so we have a very good lineup of speakers here today at this event. Um, we have Lindsay German, who's the convener for Stop the War, Adam Johannes from Stop the War Cardiff. Um, they'll open up with some short speeches. Then we'll have a break people to be able to get a cup of tea and mingle. Um, following that we'll have um, two more speeches, one from Isla, Isla Gole who is a politics lecturer up at Aberystwyth University and then um, a speech from Mark Sorotka who is the General Secretary of PCS and after that we'll have some questions from the floor. So we've got a lot to get through so without further ado I would like to um, ask you all to put your hands together and welcome Lindsay German from Let's Stop the War Company. Thanks very much, Harry, and thanks to everybody for coming. And um, I think it's a tremendous uh, achievement. I've noticed over the last few months that across Wales we're getting more and more support for Stop the War, that when we had the protests a few weeks ago over the Syria strikes, there were lots of uh, demonstrations that took place and lots of, um, of activity that took place. So thanks to everybody for everything that you've done. I, I don't like to tell you this, but there's a lot more that obviously we're going to have to do if we want to create a situation where we have an anti-war government and where we have a different foreign policy in this uh, in this country, and I want to I want to start actually by just responding to what Harry said about the um, the situation with drone warfare in Aberporth and the situation here, um, because if you look at the um, the tactic of the politicians in Britain, in the United States, in all these countries. What have they done? They've realised that war is getting more and more unpopular. Uh, they realised that particularly the Iraq war was tremendously unpopular and was demonstrated against by millions of people, not just in this country, but across Europe. They estimate February 15th, 2003, 30 million people demonstrated around, uh, around the world. They know how unpopular this is. They know people don't want to fight and to die in war. So what is their solution to this? It should be to stop the wars, it should be to de develop an alternative way of doing things, but actually their solution to this is to make the wars more remote, less involving uh, military personnel from our own country and from the United States, and I'm in favour of not involving military personnel in these sorts of things, but at terrible cost to the people of the countries where they are using drones, where they are using 
um, cruise missiles, where they are using all of these uh, all of these kind of things. And the question, I think, the big question, which is very rarely discussed in, in this country and very rarely addressed in Parliament or anywhere else, we only really discuss these things when there's yet another attempt to intervene in another country and bomb another country. But actually, the big question is that we are now 18 years into the war on terror. It's 2001, September 2001, when George Bush launched the war on terror with the war in Afghanistan, then the war in Iraq, then we had later the bombing of Libya, we've had uh, the intervention in Syria, we've had a uh, continuing war going on in Yemen, uh, an absolutely disastrous war which is um, uh, aided and abetted by the British military, who actually are in the British military personnel are in the control rooms of the, uh, of the Saudi bombers. So they tell them exactly where to bomb and how to bomb and give them all this kind of expertise. These are the kind of questions we should be looking at and we should be asking why after 18 years of this war which was supposed to bring peace and democracy and eradicate terrorism around the world, do we have more wars, more terrorism, more instability around the world? And of course the people who suffer from these things are not, for the most part, people in this country, for the most part, it is people in the countries that have been bombed, particularly civilians. You know, war is always talked about as a kind of, you know, between different militaries and it's discussed in terms of war games. Actually, the vast majority of casualties of war these days are civilians, women, children, old people, people who can't get away from the war zone. It's not people who are fighting, it's not people who are armed, it's people who have absolutely nothing that they can do to stop these things happening. And actually, if you look at the First World War, which was a horrific war in many, many ways, with what was it, 20 million dead internationally as a result of the First World War, 15% of those casualties is estimated as civilians. So in other words, 85% were military. Today, it's the other way around. That, uh, you know, the vast majority of, of casualties of these things are war, are, are civilians. So that, I think, is something that we need to bear in mind. We also need to bear in mind that the people who started this war in the first place, who've been proved so wrong, who've done things so disastrously, are the same people who now decide that these wars are going to go ahead. The man who is uh, Donald Trump's defence secretary, a man called James Mattis, who's known as Mad Dog, which gives you probably some idea of uh, his kind of uh, proclivities for warfare, was the man who was responsible for the siege and the destruction of the Iraqi city of Fallujah, if people remember back in 2004. Civilians were deliberately targeted in that, uh, in that siege, very, very deliberately targeted. They used white phosphorus. If you look at the evidence now, there are huge numbers of children born with deformities and born with all sorts of problems. There's a high level of cancer, all of these things. Uh, this is the person who is now responsible for defence, as it's euphemistically called, warfare in the United States of America. If you come closer to home, uh, the Iraq war is always blamed on Tony Blair, and I'm absolutely in favour of blaming it on Tony Blair. I think personally that he should be in the Hague facing war crimes trials and not um, an estimated worth £50 million pounds and owns nine houses and and apparently has absolutely uh, carte blanche to go on the BBC any time he wants, any time he gets some crackpot idea in his head about absolutely anything, including he's always in favour of more wars against Iran, against Syria, against all these people. He always gets listened to. Alistair Campbell, who was his uh, spin doctor, who, who sexed up the dossier in 2002 and said that uh, there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq which could hit British interest in 45 minutes. He's now on every panel programme and on the television that you care to see. These are people who show absolutely no shame or remorse or understanding of the disastrous effects of their policies. But of course we shouldn't forget that the Tories also were massively behind uh, the war in Iraq. They weren't in government at the time but virtually all of them voted for it and have voted uh, again and again for wars. And only a few weeks ago, as we all know, uh, Theresa May uh, joined in the airstrikes on, on Syria um, alongside Macron in France and alongside Trump uh, in the US without even having 
uh, feeling the need to even take this to a vote in Parliament. Um, and that is obviously what they want to do. The Iraq war was a sign that they had to at least go to Parliament, not that I trust the MPs in Parliament to do the right thing, because they keep doing the wrong thing about all these, but at least that is 650 people voting as opposed to one Prime Minister making, uh, making the decision. Now they are trying to get away from even having to have that very, very minor restraint on them. So we have all of these things, the refusal to acknowledge what's going wrong, the refusal to come to grips with what they've done, and of course, even the refusal to think there's any other alternative. I noticed that uh, I think it's a very welcome development that North and South Korea uh, are meeting together and trying to get an end. You know, there is no formal agreement still to the end. There's no peace treaty to, uh, at, at, at the end of the Korean War more than 60 years ago. It's a country very, very divided. Um, and I think it's a good development that they are getting together and trying to get a peace treaty and trying to get an alternative to nuclearisation of, uh, of their peninsula. Donald Trump is claiming credit for this. Now, it seems to me that actually the reason that Moon, who's the uh, president in the south of um, Korea, who is actually anti-war, and that was one of the things that he, uh, he, his platform for election was that he wanted to be closer to North Korea and find a, a way of, of working with North Korea. Uh, but he's not getting any credit. My personal view is that both he, uh, both the south and the north thought we'd better get together Otherwise, Donald Trump will come and interfere, and God knows what's going to happen then. And very sensible. Uh, these are people who've got very great experience of a really, really terrible war back in the uh, back in the 1950s. So we've got all these issues that are still with us. And I think one of the things that sickens me most is the way in which these wars are reported and the way in which we hear about them. We hear huge amounts about the bombing of Aleppo, quite rightly, that I'm against all the bombing. I'm against bombing by Russia, I'm against bombing by Syria, I'm against bombing by America and Britain, Turkey, all the others who actually are involved in bombing in, in Syria. But it's worth knowing, and I, I guess a lot of you will know this, but in Mosul, in the Iraqi city of Mosul, which was uh, bombed by America and Britain over the last year or so, the, um, the uh, Air Wars, which is a, a kind of think tank that, that monitors uh, aerial bombing, reckons at least 8,000 people, civilians, were killed in the bombing of Mosul. You never hear about it. You never see it on the BBC. You never see any of these things. I've talked about Yemen. You don't hear about that. You hear very little about what Israel is doing, both in terms of bombing Syria and, of course, its weekly assaults on the people of Gaza as they're trying to have their march for a return, which is going on. And one place we never hear about at all is Libya, which is, you know, when people say, oh, we should have bombed Syria so we could have got rid of, rid of Assad and everything would have been wonderful, they've actually done this before, and they did it in Libya, exactly that. This was going to be for regime change. They would get rid of Gaddafi, everything would be better. Look at what the situation there is now. There are two separate governments, there's a multi-sided civil war, there's complete barbarity in parts of Libya, even as far as there's been the reintroduction of slave markets in part of Libya. Um, all of these things are going on. Do we have any scrutiny of this? Do we have anything like that at all? No, we don't. The other thing we don't have any scrutiny of is that there is a huge arms race going on between the biggest powers in the world. Every country is increasing its armaments. You know, it's true of Russia, it's true of China, it's true of the United States, it's true of Britain. And if you look at Saudi Arabia, which I regard as one of the major threats to peace in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia has doubled its spending on arms since the beginning of this century and is now one of the biggest arms spenders in the world. You wonder why. Well, Yemen is one reason, repression of their own people is another reason, and what they want, a future war with Iran, is probably mm -hmm. the third reason. So all of these things are very important for us. And it's incredible, really, that we have, uh, that the anti-war movement gets attacked whenever we say these wars aren't right. We had this most recently over Syria. There was the chemical attack or alleged chemical attack in, uh, in Douma, which I'm totally against all chemical weapons and totally against any chemical weapons attacks wherever 
they come from. But it seems to me the sensible way to proceed with that is to get the Organisation for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons to go to investigate what exactly happened, rather than what did they do. They fired 100 cruise missiles. Now, I'm sure Mark will talk about this, but each cruise missile that they fire costs $1 million. $1 million US dollars. That's 100. That's 100 million US dollars that could have helped refugees, could have built hospitals in Syria, could have built hospitals in this country, could have done any of those things. This is what they talk about, and yet they accuse us of being callous and not caring about human beings. Now, my opposition to the bombing of Syria or anywhere else is not because I don't care about the Syrian people, it's not because I don't care about chemical attacks, but it's because we, every example we've had has made the situation even worse. That is the experience, and it's still the experience is still going on. And you know, one of the reasons that they deny the effects of these wars is because they don't want, obviously, the people who vote for them to know the truth of these wars, because I can assure you, if people knew the whole truth on a mass scale, virtually none of these politicians would ever get elected again. But it's also the contempt in which they hold the people of these countries. You know, now people are being sent back to Iraq because it's supposed to be a safe place. It isn't a safe place. People are being sent back to Afghanistan because it's supposed to be a safe place. So if you're an asylum seeker or a refugee from one of those countries, you have no right to stay here because you're fleeing danger. And this is the, the most gross hypocrisy. And of course, caring for those refugees in this country costs a fraction, a tiny fraction, of what it costs to bomb any of the countries. But that is the priority of our, uh, our government. And that just leads me to why I think an anti-war government is so important. Now, the great thing I think that has changed all of us in the last, in the last three years is that we now do have a leader of the Labour Party who actually is somebody who has a brilliant record of opposing not just war, opposing uh, nuclear weapons, opposing uh, colonialism of the sort that we're now seeing again in parts of the Middle East, of, of, of having a great record on foreign policy. I believe that if Jeremy Corbyn were Prime Minister and were able to implement this foreign policy, then I think actually it would make a huge difference to how people see Britain in the world. It would make people realise that it's not just hanging on to the special relationship with America. It's not just hanging on to the glory days of empire. It's not just hanging on to any of these things. It's actually trying to have a foreign policy which isn't based on racism and imperialism, but which is based on equality and justice and trying to deal with some of the problems of the world, which are many, but which could be dealt with if people approach them in that kind of way. So I think this is very important. I think that Jeremy Corbyn's success was in part a result of the anti-war movement, that we didn't stop the war in 2003 over Iraq, but we have shifted public opinion so that people regard it as a war that should never have taken place and that has brought only misery to the, uh, to the Iraqi people. Um, the opinion polls on the Syria airstrikes, very interestingly, straight away, despite the media, despite the vast majority of politicians, were against any airstrikes, because people are becoming increasingly convinced that these things are about showing that you have power, showing that you can control the area, not about delivering the kind of humanitarian interventions that people really, uh, need, to, really, people really need. But, as we know, Jeremy Corbyn faces opposition not just from the Tory party, not just from um, the right-wing media, but also inside his own party. And I mean, I, I feel I have to say something about the question of anti-Semitism, which has come up such a lot in recent weeks, and that yesterday, uh, Mark Wadsworth, who is a black uh, activist who I've known for 40 years, who, um, whose father fought in the RAF in the Second World War and came over on the Windrush and all of this kind of thing, it's rather ironic that this is somebody who was expelled yesterday for, it seems to me, a completely trumped-up charge of, uh, of anti-Semitism. And I think this is an issue which we have to take on in the anti-war movement. I'm totally opposed to all forms, forms of racism. I'm sure everybody in this room is, and I'm totally opposed to anti-Semitism. I think Jews have had a terrible history of being persecuted, as we know. We talk about the Holocaust, but before that and since that, there have been much persecution of, of Jewish people, which we all have to oppose 
and uh, campaign against, and it's growing again, particularly among the far right in Eastern Europe, where it's, uh, these parties are in government and are persecuting Jews among, uh, among others. So I think we have to be opposed to that. But I also think we cannot allow, firstly, we cannot allow this to be used in a way where it becomes that we aren't allowed to criticise what Netanyahu is doing to the Palestinians. I noticed Natalie Portman, who's a famous actor who was born in Israel, has been called borderline anti-Semitic because she said she wouldn't take an award from Netanyahu. So this is the kind of and and, and this is the kind of instrumental instrumentalization of anti-Semitism, which I think we have to reject as well. It is a serious problem. It has to be dealt with where it exists, but it is not a problem that you can use as a justification for not taking up the cause of the Palestinians. And it's not something as well that you can see as separate from other forms of racism. I mean, I was, you know, the London Evening Standard, which you luckily are hundreds of miles away from and don't have to read on a, on a daily basis, um, edited by former Tory Chancellor George Osborne, had the headline this week, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, oh, it just says Corbyn, of course, Corbyn, I apologise for anti-Semitism. I mean, I'd like to know when the Evening Standard is going to apologise for its racist campaign against the Muslim mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, which they did week after week after week. And, you know, therefore, I think if we're going to talk about these things, let's put it in perspective of all racism in society is bad, all of it has to be fought, and we don't separate out one from the other. So it seems to me all of these issues are major issues for us. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying a little bit about what's coming up. As you're probably aware Donald Trump is paying us a visit on Friday the 13th of July. Let's make it an unlucky Friday for him. We don't know where he's going. Um, the rumour is Scotland and Windsor Castle and possibly down the street. It's going to be a quick visit because he's going back to France on the on Bastille Day on the 14th because he loves watching these military parades that they have in uh, in Paris on uh, on that kind of day. But it seems to me this is something that should concentrate the minds of all of us. Obviously, we've got many reasons for post-Trump, not just his warmongering and his militarism and his racism, but all of these. And his, what he's going to do to the Palestinians because he's moving the U.S. embassy. Um, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem next month, and uh, all of these things are destined to make the situation in the Middle East much, much worse. So I think we have to be organised and campaigning around all these things. And I'd very much like to thank you for all the work that you've done, but to say we are going to have to continue to do this, we are going to have to continue to mobilise, we are going to have to lobby and demonstrate and take direct action, anything that we can do in order to stop these wars. And the more people we can get to do that and the more places that we can get to do that, the more we are in a position to defeat this government and to defeat those who don't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you, you'll have an opportunity to put some questions to Lindsay at the, uh, when we get to the question and answer session at the end. But, uh, I'm now going to hand over to Adam Johannes. He's from Cardiff Stop the War and um, he's an old comrade of mine. Um, without further ado, carry on. Okay, I, I think that it is very important that we understand the nature of the historical moment. It really feels to me that over the last 20 or 30 years, governments, not only in this country, but all over the world, became what I like to call the disimagination machine, drilling deep into their minds and their populations. There is no alternative. But it really feels to me that, particularly since the snap election over the summer, that millions of people are learning to dream again in this country as certain very basic issues come to the fore. Issues such as, if somebody is working 40 hours a week, that person should not be in poverty, should not struggle to pay the rent of bills. Nobody should work full-time work for part-time income. A £10 minimum wage is not a radical idea. It is a matter of basic justice. Housing is a human right. The precious water, the essential water that we use to wash 
Our bodies to drink, the railways and electricity and gas should be owned by us, not profit-making corporations. Education is not a commodity to be bought and sold on a marketplace. It is a gift from one generation to the next. And if university education is free in Norway and Finland and Iceland and Germany, why not here? Why not here? And I think perhaps more relevantly for us today, I think another question is coming to the fore, that if Germany and Ireland and Spain and Iceland and Canada uh, and uh, over 180 countries can exist without nuclear weapons, why does our government want to spend 205 billion pounds on weapons of mass destruction? A 10 pound minimum wage is in the working class interest, spending 205 billion on nuclear weapons is not, so we have to choose the human race over the nuclear race and the arms race. But I think the question that still needs to be brought into this agenda is the question of Britain's role in the world, the question of ending the cycle of wars that began in 9-11, uh, the cycle of wars, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, war in Libya, war in Lebanon, war in Palestine, war on democracy, war on human rights, war on Muslims, a war on our minds. Now, I think that the problem of the world today is that there is too much poverty and too much war. What we need is a war on poverty, not a war on the poor. I read recently that the annual US military budget is around 600 billion pounds. 600 billion pounds. But the annual amount needed to end global hunger is only 30 billion pounds. 600 billion to wage war, 30 billion to end global hunger. They can find money to end, wage the war, but they can't, sorry, they can find money to fund the war, but they can't find the money to feed the poor. Now, quite often, when I speak at these kind of meetings, uh, I like to tell a story uh, called The Pirate and the Emperor, uh, and I'd like to share it with you today. Uh, long ago, a pirate was brought before Alexander the Great, and uh, Alexander said to the pirate, how dare you loot my ships and terrorize the people. And the pirate paused for a minute, and then he said, wait a minute, I loot a few ships and terrorize a few people, and I am called pirate and brigand. You loot entire continents and terrorize entire peoples, and yet they call you emperor and god. And I think that's the world we're living in today. We live in a world gone wrong. The world is out of joint and it's going to take very powerful movements to manipulate things back to the place. We live in a world where some people wallow in champagne while millions are denied access to clean water, where some people, we live in a world where the rich live up on the mansion on the hill while the poor play house on the cardboard boxes and in bridges. I read um, that the top 1% now own more wealth than the bottom 99%, and that is a crime against humanity. Now we always said in the anti-war movement way back when, when the chickens came home to roost in the events of 9-11, that if you start off waging war on Muslims abroad, you end up waging war on Muslims at home. And I think that's what we saw. First they fed us weapons of mass deception about weapons of mass destruction. And then when we revealed their weapons of mass destruction were weapons of mass deception, they hit us with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Islamophobia and racism. I think it's very important that we understand that Islamophobia is not a hate crime, it's a, actually a state crime. It is the official ideology of much of the Western political establishment. And the flip side, I feel, of these wars abroad is the refugee crisis, and it's very important as an anti war movement that we demand that they open the borders because I think there's enough money both for refugees and for the homeless who line many streets of towns and cities like my own, if we take the money from the corporations. Now, as I said, we now have, I think for the first time in decades, an anti-war leader of the main opposition party, but I think it's important to say that Jeremy Corbyn is not the Messiah, he is the leader of the Labour Party, that we have an anti-war leader of Labour, but Labour, I do not think, is yet an um, anti-war party. I'm not actually a member of any party, but obviously uh, what the main opposition party does is very important for this country and the world. And I think we have a real problem that the manifesto for the many, not the few, while it was many leaps forward in many respects, 
I still feel it's very weak that uh, the question of spending, your know, Labour was still committed to spending billions on uh, renewing Trident. Uh, there's commitments to increase the military budget when we should be slashing military spending because, as people will know, we have the highest military spending in Europe and the only reason why is because Britain used to have an empire but now we don't have an empire. Our rulers, they still want to be players on the world stage. So they pitch themselves to the Americans, and that's why our military spending is so high. And I think that works very well for them, but what benefit do we get out of having the highest military spending when we have a crumbling welfare state? And so, you know, I think we have to say that, you know, this demand to slash the military budget and divert the money into welfare has to become central to the politics of the 21st century. And I think another huge problem is the continuing commitments to the membership of NATO, the nuclear armed military alliance that binds us to American foreign policy and the whole special relationship uh, with America. And I think the final issue we have is, uh, I think that the acid test really is Palestine. That, um, you know, it was, very, it was great at the Labour Party conference when Emily Thornberry said we're going to have an ethical foreign policy. But uh, then a few weeks later, she had dinner with Netanyahu the war criminal Gaza, where she said that Israel is a beacon of democracy, freedom and equality in the region, and yet she's still on the front bench. And I think it's very important that we understand who is David and who is Goliath in this conflict. Because you can't compare Israel, which is a state with nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, that's used them in Gaza, tanks, F-16s, helicopter gunships, with the Palestinians who have nothing but their ha bare hands and the rocks of their homeland to defend themselves. And we have to uh, stop equating the oppressor and the oppressed or, and really resist uh, any attempt to um, conceptualize the Israel-Palestine conflict as a conflict between two equal sides. And that brings me to another fundamental issue around Palestine is I believe that if it was just a conflict between uh, just a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, I think there could be a solution, but it's Israel backed by the United States, backed by the most powerful states on earth. You see Israel as the attack dog of Western foreign policy in the region. So we really need to uh, we really need two movements to the question of Palestine can't be solved within the box of Palestine. Two things need to happen. The uh, the Arab left used to have a slogan that the road to Jerusalem and a liberated Palestine runs through Cairo, Amman, Damascus, and Beirut, but there could be no solution to the question of Palestine without revolution from one end of the Middle East to the other to topple the corrupt kings the public presence, the tyrants, the torturers, and break American power in the whole region. That's fundamental. But we also, uh, we don't live in the Middle East. We live in countries like Britain. We have to break the link between Britain and Israel. And I think for many Palestinians today, solidarity is spelled in a very simple three-letter word. BDS, which means boycott, divestment, sanctions, to isolate Israel just as we isolated South Africa in the days of apartheid. And we have to start talking this language. I don't think it's very good enough for the Labour front bench to just talk about uh, there has to be a return to meaningful negotiations. There could be no meaningful negotiations when America is backed by America. The only peace process that we need is not one which offers Palestinians, in the words of the late intellectual freedom fighter, Edward Said, a kingdom of illusions, with Israel still firmly in charge. The peace process is boycott, divestment, sanctions, and that needs to be uh, raised up in the agenda uh, in the Labour Party and in the trade union movement. Now, I just want to conclude by saying a few things. I come here today uh, from Cardiff, and uh, 30 years ago, in 1982, there was a march led by women uh, from our city hall to Greenham Common to set up the famous peace camp uh, protesting the stationing of NATO cruise missiles. It was then a time of hope. A year earlier, Wales became the first country in the entire world to declare itself a nuclear-free zone as every single uh, county Council opposed nuclear weapons uh, that year. And we really have to ask, I think, how do we get from those kind of politics to the politics where our First Minister during the Scottish referendum said, if Scotland goes independent, we would love to station nuclear weapons in Wales. Or where during the voting tried that the majority of Welsh MPs voted uh, for nuclear weapons, some representing the poorest, some of the poorest communities on this island, but quite happy to see billions uh, wasted on uh, nuclear weapons and I think we have, 
you know, we have to talk about anti-war government, but I also think we need an anti-war Welsh government. Uh, you know, we have a real problem, I think, during the crisis, uh, which is another foreign policy issue, during the crisis in Catalonia, uh, Mark Drakeford, who was one of the Welsh government ministers, he was asked to make a statement, and I'll never forget the word he used, he said, as a matter of principle, that was his exact word, as a matter of principle, the Welsh government does not comment on international affairs, and you have to say, since when has that been a matter of principle for socialists? Surely, you know, in the 1930s, in the days of aid for Spain, might just use the word and use words like internationalism and solidarity. So that was quite incredible. But uh, actually, this argument has a long history in Welsh politics. During the Iraq War, this same line of non devolved issues was used by our then First Minister, the late Rodri Morgan, where he was asked his opinion on Iraq. Uh, on question time, he infamously said, I don't have an opinion, but this was the biggest debate in British politics. And uh, he continued to sit on the fence. He said, well, I can't take an opinion. This is a Westminster issue. This issue was once again raised uh, after Calvin Jones' uh, statement supporting Trident. There was a debate in the Senate, and once again, Labour AMs, many who are long-standing opponents of nuclear weapons, like Julie Morgan Matrick, would said, this is a non-devolved issue. You know, the Assembly doesn't need to take an opinion, and yet we look on Iraq, the First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, the then Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, are publicly opposed the war in Iraq. On nuclear weapons, the Scottish, the Scottish Parliament, both Scottish Labour and the SNP have opposed nuclear weapons. So why um, do we have this resistance uh, in the Welsh political scene to taking a political stance? And as was mentioned, I think, by Harry and Lindsay, who also have a big problem in Wales, that the Welsh Government has very much built links with arms industries uh, and brought arms industries into Wales, and we have to say that it's time to beat the swords into ploughshares. These are always sold on the basis of jobs, but we know that uh, if we transfer to renewable energy, we can do this without loss of employment and actually increase jobs, and we have to start talking about a just transition in Wales, away from arms industries to green industries, away from industries that take away lives or industries that save lives. So it really feels that we have a crisis of leadership in Wales. Where do we go from here? Do we go politics as usual? Do we go backwards? Or do we go politics as change? And I think that the politics of austerity of war must be confronted head on. And we have to talk about a Welsh government that opposes wars abroad that opposes nuclear weapons, that supports the Palestinians and other oppressed people, like the uh, Kurdish people, that uh, fans the flames of anti-austerity revolt, both here and abroad. That's the future that we have to fight for, because leadership is not sitting in an office in Cardiff Bay, sitting high, looking low. It's not theorizing about change. Leadership is not managing the status quo, it's managing to change it. Now, I just want to end by saying there's, I think a Jewish proverb, there's good wine in every generation. And uh, I remember when I first got involved in left-wing politics, particularly European radicals of a southern generation will refer to themselves as 1968ers, so a tribute to a year of global revolt where people marched against the Vietnam War and the people of Vietnam fought back, where black communities mobilized in the United States and we had the biggest general strike in Europe. And, I really feel that the most profound political event of my adult life was the Arab Revolution of 2011. Uh, we saw, I think, one of the most profound movements uh, that's ever taken place. It was a, quite an extraordinary year. It began with a Tunisian vegetable seller, a grocer called uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, an unemployed graduate, setting himself on fire in protest against austerity, uh, leading to the toppling of the dictatorship of Ben Ali. It spread to Egypt, uh, where we saw Cairo became, become a volcano in the heart of the Arab world. And uh, after 18 days, the dictatorship of Mubarak brought down. We saw revolt, fled, uh, revolt spread to Libya and Yemen uh, and across the Middle East and North Africa. But I think what was really significant was that fight back actually inspired people beyond the Middle East, in Europe. Uh, in the Arab world, they raised the slogan, the people demand the fall of the regime, but in Spain, a movement of young people called the Indignados, the Indignant, they camped out in public squares and they raised the slogan, we are not objects in the hands of bankers or politicians. We want real democracy now. 
the same tactic was used in America and then in Europe, in the Occupy movement, who said, we are the 99%. And it's very, I think it's very painful when you see what's going on now in the Middle East. I, a friend of mine who uh, is Egyptian, who was part of the April 16th movement in, um, in Cairo, she says to me, she said, uh, sometimes it seems like a dream to me now, Adam, the revolution. She said, uh, I think, did it really happen? Did I really camp for 18 days with millions in Tahrir Square? You know, these unlimited horizons that everything would change. Did I really have those feelings when we see the military back in power? Yeah. And um, during the refugee crisis, I attended a, a vigil for refugees, and uh, I spoke to a Syrian refugee who, he told me his story, he said I was a student at Aleppo University, uh, we rose up in our thousands for a bread of freedom. We are having peaceful demonstrations, we are marching. But he said, now, my brothers are refugees in Turkey. I'm a refugee in Wales, and I think I'll never return home again to my country. And it's um, you know, really painful to see that going. And at the same vigil, I remember a um, assembly member, she asked a rhetorical question of Syria. She said, where is the international community? And as I was the next speaker, I gave a rhetorical answer. I said, the international community is in Syria when the, there's a saying, when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. There's never maybe been a war where you have so many great powers and regional powers intervening, each pursuing their own interests. But I think when we look at what's going on in Iraq, when we look at what's going on in Yemen, where thousands of young people once tried to wage a youth revolution, but you see a civil war, uh, America and Britain backing Saudi bombing, 40, 10,000 dead, 40,000 maimed, wounded, and disabled, uh, a million suffering from cholera, the biggest humanitarian crisis on earth. When you see in Egypt the military back in power, again a dictatorship, when you see Syria hang drawn and quartered, it's very hard to understand what's going on. And when you see the biggest refugee crisis in a generation, and Try to process this. I think the reason why this is happening is I think that when you have a movement like the Arab Spring, like the Arab Revolutions, of that depth, that breadth, that magnitude, that unleashes such hope around millions, not just in the Middle East, but around the world, that it takes, I think, great savagery and great cruelty uh, to bury that memory. And that's why I think we're seeing uh, this huge upheaval across the Middle East, and uh, why we're seeing such savagery and almost an unholy alliance of great powers, of regional powers, religious fanatics and the remaining regimes to crush uh, that memory of revolution. So I think that the only way forward, I hope that in my lifetime once again, we'll see revolutions in the capitals of the Arab world. But I think that the best way that we can uh, help people abroad is in the words of, to use a phrase from Bernie Sanders, is to wage a political revolution at home that can take power out of the hands of the corporate elite I place it back in the hands of the people where it belongs, we, the people. And um, I think just to conclude, clearly, to use a ton of phrases, 1984, and uh, Donald Trump is coming to the UK on Friday the 13th, or rather, it's 2018, because actually, Donald Trump is just the icing on a cake that was baked for a very long, very long, long time. And I think that the demonstrations which take place will be tremendously important because the whole world will be watching and we can say to the world that Mr. Trump, you made a mistake, you thought that you would divide us by where we come from, who we are, who we love, but what you're doing is bringing us together into a powerful movement for change, that uh, there will be no retreat on women's rights, workers' rights, immigrant rights, racial justice or climate justice, we're not going backwards, we're going forwards, so I feel that I probably said too much, so I'll just end by saying uh, thanks once again uh, for being, uh, allowing me to speak here and uh, see you on the streets. Well okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Very welcome. We're going to have um, a quick, a very quick five minute break um, so people can get a cup of tea and a quick chat, and then we'll be straight back. Okay, so we move on to, to this second session and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Isla Gold from 
at the university. Thank you very much. I think it's always a great pleasure to take part of Karadigian Co uh, Coalition Against War and also thanks to Johnny for organizing. I was some of you, I was supposed to be here I think in the previous event. I lost my grandmother in Turkey. I couldn't go back and then I was depressed that I couldn't be with you. And it's always a big, it's always exciting to hear the, the support about the Middle East. What I want to do is especially focus on even challenge the question, do we need a, a new British foreign policy towards the Middle East? I will say, is there a British foreign policy towards the Middle East? Because it's inconsistent, it's incoherent, and going back to history, I don't want to go as deep as the First World War, but we know how Britain has never ever had an ethical foreign policy towards the Middle East, never supported democracy in the Middle East, and responsible all of the messes we are facing today in the region. And what I want to do is someone as a Kurdish woman, born in Turkey, living in exile in Wales, so I'm a minority among minority, and it's a nice feeling to criticize this majority and government what kind of impact what we can do. So yes, I'm a, I'm a lecturer in, in university, but my interest in these issues is not only academic, it's personal. And I think personal is political. If you come from an oppressed background like I am, Kurdish Muslim woman, you know what it means. And it's, 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 it's sad. What I want to argue is basically there is a changing global context, there is a changing regional context, and there is even changing local context. Local is globalized these days. What we used to see as kind of locked in the Middle East as a regional level is part of the international level you are discussing. I grew up with these issues, Islamic terrorism, secularism, European modernity, let's look at Europe and change the Muslim society since the end of the Ottoman Empire. And, and, and all of a sudden, all the issues I grew for 34 years ago has become part of these debates. And, and with disgrace, so many so-called experts trying to understand what is going on in the Middle East. So what I want to do is basically... In terms of British foreign policy, what can be done and what kind of mistakes we all know have done uh, in, the, in the region. British foreign policy, as uh, previous speakers uh, highlighted, was based on, I think Lindsay, you especially said, that special relationship with the United States of America using Europe as a bridge, kind of bringing Atlantic and, and the European Union. So the last 40 years as a close relationship with an Atlanticist US and commitment to a strong European Union is no longer the case. European Union is gone after Brexit. And what I will argue is basically this is the end of special relationship. That's what the British policymakers have to realize. I mean, I remember the, the cartoon as Blair the Poodle of kind of... America, that's really insulting, but they just need to accept that the special relationship is gone. And the US has become more focused in Asia, Asia Pacific, no more interested engagement internationally, and their interest in the Middle East, that is my second big argument, there is a new changing regional context, and if Britain follows what Trump is doing in a very unproductive way, as again Lindsay emphasized, we are inviting more instability, more insecurity, and more terrorism, unfortunately, in the Middle East. And what I want to say is, uh, we need a new UK, I think it's even the parliamentarian paper in May published last year, saying that the Middle East constitutes the present um, uh, 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 the, the present challenge to the policymakers and UK is facing significant shifts in foreign policy scene and stance. And we need a new UK Middle East strategy and set of policies that reflect the new reality in the region. 
but we don't know what the new reality is. I think that's the trouble because it's such a complex, it's such a mess. Britain had historical responsibilities as one of the colonial powers. Even the name of the Middle East is created. I was in foreign office doing my research in public record office in Kew Gardens, and you have the debate going on. How do we name after the end of the Ottoman Empire? They were they were the three reliants of the Ottoman Empire. The Arab Bureau is coming up calling it the Middle East because you are looking from London near Middle Far East. But if you live in Istanbul, it's not the Middle East. It's not. And, and my question, my rhetorical question is, why London, Washington, Paris should decide the future of our countries, our region, our peoples. I'm speaking as we, someone born in the Middle East, speaks regional languages, knows the history, and suffers from that. And, and, and why, why do we make all these mistakes? And I think what I'm seeing historically, in, instead of these historical responsibilities, it's the security, vested interest, strategic interest, and trade. I mean, if Middle East was not producing oil, I'm not sure if they if we were producing, I don't know, Brussels spirits. That's the, the most heated vegetable, isn't it? I mean, will they intervene in the Middle East? I doubt it. But there is a new changing Middle East because the Western economies are trying to change their addiction to oil and the global economy. So we might see different scenarios because they won't need oil as much as they did in the 20th century. With new technologies, with new inventions, that might be a different scenario. And, and, and another argument, as I started saying that, the British foreign policy towards the Middle East has never been ethical and consistent. When I say ethical foreign policy, I am thinking, a foreign policy respects democracy, supports democratic regimes and human rights, including minority rights. I think we talked about Palestinians and the Kurdish <laughs> minority people. I am not saying this. On the contrary, these interests are sidelined uh, for, for trade and economic interests like the arms deals with Saudi Arabia. And also, what we are seeing in the sense... Um, uh, the start is not necessarily what is going on at the moment, but again, the Arab uprisings. I don't like the term Arab Spring because and then it becomes the winter. We are all disappointed. But Arab uprisings in 2010, that was the first time I think British governments had a chance to show that they support democracy and change in the region. Again, the first time I was really excited that how uh, Cameron at that time went to Egypt after resignation of Husni Mubarak in Egypt and then and, and, and in, in engaging with Tunisia. Uh, but all of a sudden, again, these kind of hopes are gone. And what I'm seeing in British foreign policy, hypocrisy and double standards. When it's necessary, sometimes supporting uh, revolutionary opposition uh, sides, but mostly siding with the dictators and, and authoritarian regimes. Again, I won't go into details. The best examples, UK sold arms to Saddam's Iraq, and then it sanctioned Iraq. It bombed and then occupied it. It became part of the US-led invasion of Iraq, and that's the mess and the beginning of what you have, the monster Daesh or the Islamic State. Many of them were the Baathist supporters. Without having long-term plan and projects, how to do make a regime change, that was the biggest mistake. And then the same thing, the UK sanction, sanctioned Libya. I mean, player handshaking with Gaddafi, you remember all these scenes. That, and all of a sudden, Dan decided to invade, invaded Libya. And, and again, as I said, we never talk about what is going on in Libya. And, but many of fighters are joining to Daesh are probably lured to this political vacuum gap that are kind of brainwashed and politicized. And, and the same thing we are seeing in Syria, in the sense it's too late, too little. I mean, if they, if they needed to intervene in Syria, it should have been done earlier. 
And the biggest hypocrisy I'm seeing this, it's not done in the name of human rights. It's done because, oh, chemical. It is just cleaning their consciousness and guilt. Morally, now it's necessary to intervene because Assad used... We don't know whether he used, but probably, yes, there is evidence that... Uh, the Assad government was behind the chemical attacks. So it's all hypocrisy and double standards. And what, what really annoys me as well, again, despite the fact that it's far part of that historical responsibilities in the region, and it lost its power. Let's face it, Britain is no longer like the US or China opening up to the Middle East, but they still have this arrogance, we know the best, and, and the neo-colonial mindset that we decide which regime should stay in power, which regime should go, when it's necessary to do a regime change. And I'm not sure anyone in the region would agree. And I think, again, uh, the uh, rhetorical question, is there an international community? My answer, there is no international community at all. Um, uh, not, 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 not that in the Middle East, but there is no. So what can the British government do in the last five minutes as the, what I call, post-EU and uh, Brexit, uh, Brexit uh, foreign policy? What we are seeing with Brexit is probably the end. I was always sceptical with the European Union. I never did because Turkey is... I never understood the paradox as well. You know, Turkey is trying to become a member of the European Union for years. You guys are already in a privileged club why would you say, no, we don't want it anymore? So it's such a big, big, big paradox for me. But on the other hand, it, as an ideal, I think it was a faulty project to begin with. Maybe this is signaling the end of European project um, and how the UK is going to find a more global or more engaging um, ethical foreign policy if necessary. I have my doubts. I don't think anything is going to change. We don't see anything has changed in the case of Palestinian issue. They, they have the major donors for the Palestinians, but on the other hand, there's no pressure on, from the government on Israel. Again, the previous speakers talked. I won't um, go into details. But more importantly, even moving to Jerusalem and this two-state solution... Uh, I think is no longer on the table. So if there is no pressure to solve one of the biggest issues in the Middle East as the Palestinian issue, because you have two indigenous peoples as stateless uh, minorities, ethnic people in the Middle East, that are the Palestinians and Kurds. And both, both those people feel betrayed by the British policies and the British Empire. Kurdish people were supposed to have their own Kurdistan at the end of the First World War, the Treaty of Sir. And again, what happened, they decided to agree with the Ankara government, and then they didn't think about the Kurds or the Armenians. Nobody cares about the minorities in the region. And, and, and I think that's what, there is no trust. There is no trust uh, to the British government and anything, and there's no evidence that they will do anything differently. And the other, uh, the other issue is the Syria uh, crisis, obviously. Uh, I mean, it is a disgrace. How many are they going to take as Syrian refugees? 20,000 by 22. How many are there in Turkey? Any guess? You know it. You know the number. How many? Three million in Turkey. I mean, I, I know there are problems with Erdogan, but if he did anything, even if it's his domestic reasons... He opened the borders, and, and, and there is cultural difference between Turks and Arabs. They can't speak Turkish, and it's really amazing. If you just, there's a, there's a BBC program, Turkey with Simon Reeve. It's wonderful. He's traveling in Turkey. And these Syrian people are learning Turkish because they say this is our home now. Like I am saying, Wales is my home now, and I had to learn English to be part of this uh, apologies, I didn't learn, learn, learn Welsh, and my excuse is I can't speak my mother tongue as Kurdish. But these people are, are learning Turkish because there's a difference. They can't go to schools. There's a lost generation of Syrian <coughs> children. Women and children are suffering more. And if you don't speak the language, you can't get a job. You can't go to the hospital. You need translators all the time. So we need to see more commitment on the Syrian in the sense of humanitarian help 
not only the security and trade relations. And the last one is, I think, again, it's, it's, it's really disappointing to see MBS now. Probably you have noticed that it's the new shorter Mohammed bin Salman. Oh, he's the new face of Saudi Arabia and modernizing Saudi Arabia with the new generation. But behind the doors, what we know, what we know is, is obviously the British government is more interested in the arms deals with Saudi Arabia. And we know, again, the arms deals are used in Yemen, the arms that they are buying from the British government. So, and, and Saudi Arabia, if there is any solution to the problems, including from the Islamic State Daesh to the local level, it's the Wahhabi ideology. And who is behind that? Saudi Arabia. And what is Saudi Wahhabism? goes back to the 19th century. If you want to understand the Middle East, you have to know the history. That is the first time when the Ottoman Empire tried to modernize with the Reformation Tanzimat, the Saudis didn't like it. And they were even against the Ottoman Empire. And that's how the Sa Sa Wahhabi Saudi interpretation of Islam as a reaction to modernization and reformism. If you want to modernize, democratize the Middle East, you have to start fighting like many regional powers and people do not like the Saudi system in the Middle East. You can't shake hands and you cannot present Saudi Arabia as the new face of Middle East and do your arms deals behind the doors. And these are, unfortunately, they don't give any credibility, accountability to the British foreign policy in the region. As an expert on the area and also as someone interested for the future of Middle East, I think these are the biggest mistakes Saudi Arabia is, is doing. And just to conclude, I think what that inconsistent and ethical um, foreign policy needs to be uh, cha challenged starting with maybe no arms deals with Saudi Arabia, and maybe more constructive solution and lo less hostility towards the minorities, such as Palestinian and Kurdish aspirations to have their own statehood, or even just nationhood, and also pressure to keep human rights on the agenda. I think that's the most important thing, because for me, human rights also includes women rights. Someone grew up in a Muslim society. I'm very grateful that I was born in a, and lived in a Turkey. I don't want to go back if there is Islamic Republic of Turkey under Erdogan's after the elections. I don't know what he has at new snap election. And, and, and similarly, more commitment to social, real democracy, not keeping dictators such as Erdogan because they are democratically elected. It is true. If you just check the democracy's definition and ticking the boxes, he won three times landslide elections, and he is, he is named as the most democratic leader. But I'm very skeptical how democratic it is, and I think that's where we need to put the pressure on the British government. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mark. We must move quite quickly here if we're going to get some questions in, so I'm not going to mess about. Mark Soroka from General Secretary from <laughs> Well, Thanks very much. Can you hear at the back? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to hold the mic. Thank you, I have to take transplant drugs and they, they make my, uh, my hand shake quite a lot, so you, you miss more than you actually hear. So I speak loudly. Can I say it's um, delighted to uh, have been asked to come and uh, address the meeting. I, I think it's, it's been some fantastic speeches. Uh, congratulations to the organisers for putting on this meeting in such a great place. Uh, and for everybody for giving up Saturday afternoon for coming. Uh, I particularly want to thank Lindsay because I've just crossed the county border from uh, Carmarthenshire to come. And Lindsay, I know, has left London at 7 o'clock this morning. And it's a fantastic speech. And Lindsay does the most amazing work on a national level to campaign against wars 
throughout uh, the world, and I, and I think you've been really inspirational, Lindsay, to people who've stood up for justice for all sorts of people for, for many, many years now. So, so well done for coming all of this way. And, um, and thanks, um, thanks also to the, to the local people who've who put on this meeting. This is a, quite a big county carriage again, and uh, I think it's great that we've got such a, such a good attendance. But look, we've had some fantastic speeches, and I know time uh, is, is running short. So I'm just going to sort of confine my remarks really to three things. Uh, how I think we can build a movement that can challenge what our government is doing, uh, both sort of in this country but also abroad. Secondly, what I think the role of the trade unions is to order to argue amongst their own members, uh, to see past sort of the superficial, it's just about jobs and it's just about yourself, run look a bit wider in our tradition uh, of standing up for internationalism uh, and for peace uh, and for justice. And, and in, in starting there, let me say, I'm the General Secretary of PCS. Uh, PCS organises members who work in the civil service. That includes members who work in the MOD and including people who work at Aberporth. It includes members who work in the Home Office, in the Prison Service and in GCHQ. Now, these are not the most popular places, particularly for lefties who campaign uh, against wars and state intrusion and surveillance and everything else. But let me be clear, the people we represent are low-paid... They are people who are bullied. They are people who are being blamed for the Windrush scandal by the disgraceful Tories whose policies it is has caused deportations. Not low-paid workers in the civil service threatened with the sack if they don't meet targets, whether they are benefit sanctions or whether they are deportations. And I want to make this point because it is very important for trade unions and I think for people to recognise if we do not unionise in these areas, such as the Home Office, the prisons and other unpopular places then actually what we will see is less whistleblowing, less attempts to raise some of the undemocratic things that go on in our society. We need more trade unionists who are prepared to campaign and to stand up. And that's why we appreciate all the support that we have had, whether it is from benefit groups, disabled people against the cuts, who are campaigning against the massive job losses in the social security system, because they recognise it's not our members who are impoverishing people around the country, it is the Tories... And it has to be said, the new Labour politicians before them who demonise benefit claimants and who now demonise people who come to this country. And I'm proud, actually, of the job that our members do. And I want to say a bit about that. Because uh, when it comes to standing up about Trident and when it stands up against, for example, British bases being used for aeroplanes to fly to other parts of the country and drop their bombs, it is our trade union members who have blown the whistle that has allowed campaigns like Stop the War to expose some of these injustices. And therefore, I think, from my point of view in the trade union movement, I'm proud that our union stands very much internationally and in solidarity with the Stop the War movement and with the people and trade unionists around the world, and that we are doing our bit to campaign against these injustices. And let me say this about other trade unionists, because I have spoken, and I want to pay tribute to CND, who I know are here, for people who campaign against nuclear weapons... And I have been attacked by many other trade union leaders who said we don't understand the amount of jobs in this country that depend on the arms trade and depend on nuclear weapons. Well, let me say we have members in the MOD. Right? And our members in the MOD also work on Trident programmes and militarisation. And the answer for us wasn't to say, well, because we have members in the MOD, it means we support war and it means we support nuclear weapons. Because if we did that, we would be in favour of mass unemployment because it would mean more workers in job centres. The role of a trade union is not to focus down only on the narrow economic issues and give disregard to the world that we live in. It is to actually stand up and say this. Of course we want the people working in the MOD and in the nuclear industry and other places to keep well-paid, skilled jobs in their communities. But the reality is that does not depend on making nuclear weapons and making arms. It actually says, why don't we start working towards a million new climate jobs? Why don't we actually ensure that we diversify instead of building weapons of mass destruction and tanks and bombs that cost a million pounds each? We build wind turbines, we invest in wave technology and we do something about the environment, the houses that we need, insulate them properly to ensure all people can benefit from the skills of our members, not the arms trade and those people who export death and destruction around the world. And if more trade union leaders and trade unions were prepared to say that, 
we would have more jobs in the economies in places like Wales and in the northwest and the northeast, not less jobs. And I think that's why I'm always happy as a trade union leader to speak at meetings like this and to argue for long-term investment and skills and education for our kids who come after us, not a short-term narrow view that actually sees us not care about how our skills are used. And that's why I think where we stand on war and the international questions are so important as a trade union movement and why this meeting was called about the need for an ethical foreign policy and a government that believes in ethical foreign policy. And never has that been more important than it is today. Because I think as we meet here in Aberystwyth, we live in the most dangerous of times, but at the same time we live in the most exciting of times. We can see around us with all of the conflicts that have been talked about how the world literally can be on the edge of potential war and destruction on a scale that we have not seen for decades and decades. Or, on the other hand, we could have in this country and internationally a world that actually can see more power being put in the hands of people, more people caring about equality and justice, not just in Aberystwyth, Wales and the UK, but in all parts of the world, that we can actually build a movement that challenges so much of what we have seen in all of our lifetimes. So it is exciting, but it is also deeply dangerous. And that's why I think our job has to be, whether it's campaigning in grassroots movements like this, or the trade unions, or in political parties, is to say to people we have to lift our horizons and not be taken in by those people whose politics tell them that they will say anything to justify what they are doing. They will appeal to any prejudice. They will play any divide and rule, whether it's people in work against those in benefits, people in the private sector against those in the public sector, or people who come to this country against people who were born in this country. Our tradition has to be, we are not for dividing anyone. We are for uniting people across this world and across this country in a way that recognises the society we live in is run by a very small elite who exploit huge wealth and huge privilege on the back of the overwhelming majority. And the way they get away with it is they tell people strategically lies and disinformation to make people lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think we've got to remember that when we campaign against the war, and it means we've got to be consistent about what we stand for. So let me make it clear about where I stand consistently. You see, I am against all sides in these conflicts, because I am with the people on the ground, the men, women and children, whether they are dying because of Assad's bombings, or whether they are dying because of bombings from the West. It is our concern to us whether a child dies in their own home in the Yemen with bombs dropped by Saudi Arabia or armed by this country as much as it should be for people who are dying in Syria because of bombs dropped by Assad. And if we don't remember the consistency we are with, consistently we are the people, then our enemies will seek to exploit the last atrocity that is promoted in the media to make people fall for the fact that these bombings were a merciful mission in order to bring peace to the people of Aleppo because that is lies and it is lies that we have to expose. And the reason we have to expose it is this. When people see scenes on television, they do want to do something about it. People's humanity cries out for kids who are dying, who are, whether they're being poisoned, whether they are being starved or whether they are being bombed by the Saudis or by Assad. And I think it is important for us to be consistent, because if we're not, people will be divided into one camp or the other. And the way I look at this, it's quite simple, right? I'm against the Russian bombing of the people in Syria and the bombing of Assad. I am against the bombing, whether it's from France or from Britain, America or Saudi Arabia, because the people who lose out every time are those who want to go to schools in Aleppo, those people who want to go to school in Libya and have a future and have a job rather than live in a country that has been totally and utterly smashed to smithereens. And I think that's what our movement is about. We are internationalist. We are with the peoples of the world, not whether it's President Trump or President Putin. And the reason I'm saying that and stressing it is because I have had arguments recently with people who say they are for this bombing in Syria because they think it is doing something about President Assad. And we have to expose the fact that nothing could be further from the truth. To me, one of the most grotesque things about the bombing is actually everybody knew who examined it that actually that bombing was not going to make any material difference whatsoever to people who are being killed on the ground. It was a gesture. It was a gesture to look tough. 
It was a gesture for the British, Americans and French to position themselves in some way as keepers of this world order, keepers of civilization, whereas everybody else was for death and destruction. And the truth of the matter is absolutely the opposite. And we have seen that from the conflicts that have been raised here today. In 2010, I went on question time in Stratford. It was the first time I went on. And it was just about as Britain was about to bomb Libya. And I went on to that question time, and much of the media had been about how grotesque Gaddafi was and how this tyrant had to be toppled. And a lot of people were taken in by it. I tell you what was interesting about that question time. Boris Johnson was on. And at that time, Boris Johnson said he agreed with me that he was against the bombing of Tripoli, he didn't think it would make any difference, and he actually stood against that bombing. Contrast that now to Boris Johnson, who is being gung-ho, beating his chest like he is some modern-day man who is going to bring peace and harmony to this world. But I did that in 2010. Lindsay was doing it in 2010. I'm back in the early 2000s. I'm back in the 1990s, 1980s. And and, and we've done it because we've consistently, I think, stood with the people. And I think that is really important so that people don't think we're indifferent to death and suffering. That people don't think those lefties just don't care, they're callous. Because we make the case, we are the people who care. Because what did happen in Libya is we did drop bombs and Gaddafi was toppled. And now that is a country in utter chaos. Just like Iraq is in utter chaos because of the death and destruction that we brought. We did not bring harmony and peace. We have brought chaos and misery and death on a scale that is unbelievable. So our job should not be to be supporting the leaders and tyrants on either side. It should be to support the people. It should be to say that as a government, we want a government that has an ethical foreign policy, that doesn't see the world as we're in this camp or that camp, It sees the world that we are always with the people, the trade unions, the people who are campaigning for justice and for equality. And just imagine if we had a country where our Prime Minister said, I don't care about a special relationship with America, I care about a special relationship with people in all parts of the globe. What type of impression would that give if this country was the leading country in giving humanitarian aid, supporting people on the ground, supporting free trade unions, fighting against despots wherever they were, that would be the beacon that could tell people wherever they live there is a different way. There is a way where we care about each other, we care about equality, we care about, dare I say it, socialism, rather than a world which is in two camps and in that side or the other, which is consistently miserable, consistently sees mass murder and consistently sees poverty and death on an unimaginable scale. And that's why, really, I want to finish by saying our job, therefore, at home, is to argue that all the money going into weapons, at the moment, should be going into health, into education, into local services. It should be to say, why are we suffering from austerity when £123 billion in this country, billion pounds of tax, is is avoided, evaded, or not collected... Because HMRC have cut 50,000 jobs, letting the tax dodgers get away with it. And we have laws that allow the rich and powerful to avoid paying their way. Why shouldn't that money be invested in public services? Why don't we stop building bombs and start building for our environment and for the homes of the people living in Cardiff, that was mentioned earlier, who are dying on our streets because they haven't got anywhere to live? So that's our job. Our job is to raise the idea here that we want anti-austerity and we want some equality at home and this is how we can do it. Let me, let me say to you just as a personal example, this, this thing on my wrist here was from an angiogram that I had in Papworth Hospital the day before yesterday because I had a heart transplant uh, 508 days ago today. Right? Three life-saving operations on, um, on our NHS. Right? Now let me tell you about those life-saving operations. Apart from the fact, and I've got to get this in, with all this anti-immigrant sentiment, Right, that the people who kept me alive, the doctor came from India, the cardiologist came from Croatia, the nurses came from the Philippines, from all over this country, from Europe, from Britain, from Asia, from Africa. So when people say, these people are not welcome in Britain, I say, if they hadn't come to Britain, I and many tens of thousands would have died. And we should honour the contribution they've come here to make and stand up against every racist, nasty policy of governments past and present and welcome people to this country. But the point, the point I wanted to make was this. This heart transplant that I had, right? A heart transplant costs half a million pounds on the NHS. It's expensive business, right? 
Now, I could not have a conventional heart transplant because of the particular condition I had. So at Papworth Hospital, I had an experimental transplant, the 25th one done in Britain. Right? That saved my life. It saved 25 other people. It cost £20,000 more than a conventional heart transplant and gives the opportunity for over 33% more people to have life-saving transplant surgery than under conventional methods. The NHS will not allow that treatment to go ahead. So three people die every single day of every single year in this country on transplant waiting lists, which we have the technology to save because of £20,000 per operation. That would not pay, probably, for Boris Johnson's hors d'oeuvre at one of his posh meals, <laughs> let alone, right, for something that really matters. And just say to ourselves, £20,000 to save one life when we spend £1 million on one bomb. Now, that's not a world that I think we want our kids to be growing up in, is it? It's a world we want to challenge. And so I really finish on, on this thought that we do have an opportunity in this country to do something about it. And whether people here are Greens, Plaid Cymru, whether people have always been Labour voters, whether people don't actually believe in any of the political parties, let's just say this. We can campaign and we should continue to campaign whatever happens in the months and years ahead. But we have an opportunity in this country now to actually have a UK Westminster government led by the most radical politician that has a chance of getting into power in this country for decades. And we let it pass at our peril. We let old bitterness and old divisions get in our way now, I think, at our peril. And I say that not because Labour in power or Jeremy Corbyn, as was described, is a messiah. But I say that to say that if we do not understand the difference between Corbyn and John McDonnell in the leading office of state that will empower people like us to finally believe that the things we fought for for decades may make a difference, we miss the chance of a lifetime. So my appeal is to build a Stop the War movement, to campaign now against the war and for funding of our public services, to make it clear we are internationalists to our core, we care about people wherever they live and we do not support despots wherever they reside. But let us also say, if we get the Tories out and we get Corbyn in, the campaigns won't have to end, the campaigns will have to continue. We will have to ensure that Corbyn realises he has the support of the people and that those traitors in his own ranks who don't want him, who want to see him off, will realise that he has the support of the people. And if we do that, politics can thrive wherever we reside in an environment that many of us have dreamed about for a long time. So I say this. Get out there and ensure that we have that government, not because you have to give your lifelong commitment to the Labour Party, but because you care about fighting austerity, you care about an ethical foreign policy, and you recognise that that change could make some of the things that we have dreamt about all our lives become a bit more real. And if we have a Prime Minister who's against nuclear weapons, regardless of what that party policy says or what some of the big trade unions says, that Prime Minister would be the biggest boost to the anti-nuclear movement in this country than we could have dreamed it. Let's seize of it, campaign against wars, against nuclear weapons, against austerity. Let's get a different government in, but let's not then put our feet up and stay at home. Let's see that as the chance to renew our activism and the world can be a whole lot better place, starting here, but hopefully all over the world. Thank you so much for that.